Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining me today is John Dornboss. John played in the NFL for 15 years and made two Pro Bowl appearances. He's also a master magician who is one of Simon Cowell's favorite contestants on America's Got Talent, and he made it to the final show in 2017, coming in third place. And John is one of Ellen DeGeneres' favorite guests on The Ellen Show. He's appeared on that one over 25 times. John's story is riveting as he survived an unbelievably tragic childhood, losing both of his parents when his father murdered his mother when he was 12 years old. His life again was changed forever recently when the Philadelphia Eagles, the year they won the Super Bowl, traded him to the New Orleans Saints. And in the medical evaluation for the trade, they found a problem with his heart that needed emergency life-saving surgery and forced him to immediately retire from football. Triumphing over difficult circumstances and achieving greatness in everything that he's done, you'll find John to be transformative, if not one of the most inspiring people you've ever met. And today we tackle topics that he's an expert in that make him a very in-demand speaker. Topics like leadership, mindset, perspective, and self-talk, forgiveness, and greatness. Join me now with this incredibly inspiring force that is John Dornboss. Well, hello, John Dornboss. Thank you for joining me today on Virtually Speaking. How the heck are you doing? Uh, first of all, this is totally rock star. Uh, second, look, I've known you a long time. I got, I got to throw you something here because I love, you know, coming up with titles is sometimes hard, right? Virtually Speaking. I actually, when, when you emailed me about this, I thought it was genius, a double meaning on both sides. So I just want to give you a, a shout out on the title of this talk being Virtually Speaking. It actually is it's funny and completely relevant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy it a lot. And, and it looks like you're kind of virtually between two palms. Yeah, so here's the deal. Uh, we're in this new world of, of, of virtual, right? Everything's virtual. Well, my wife and I realized that we're happiest when we're between the palms. So I made this little home studio like a lot of people have done. And I realized, what am I missing? What am I missing? Uh, I need to be between the palms. I need to put myself in this happy place. So that's what we did. We are now, uh, you are now, actually, this is actually the first interview in the studio, self-titled, Between the Palm Studio. Love that. And so when you guys vacation, you make sure you're always between palm trees when you're That's laying it, out. <laughs> we, we got two palm trees in front of our house. Uh, usually when we go on vacation, we go to islands or somewhere where there's palm trees because, uh, you know, anytime you're in a hammock between a palm or you're sitting between palm trees, life's usually pretty good. And, uh, we just find peace and happiness there. Indeed. And you found a lot of peace and happiness and, and you visualized so many things in your life that you wanted to have happen and you've been able to really talk well to yourself about the situations you've been in getting through tough times also visualizing what you wanted to do goals you wanted to reach and i know you've kind of like boom you've just like reached every goal i've, I've known you for such a long time and it's been over a decade and everything you said you wanted to do you've done it's pretty amazing but starting out the beginning of your life you had to overcome something pretty friggin' traumatic. Your, your father murdered your mother. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, you got through that. Yeah, you know, so I was 12 years old. My dad was, was uh, well, this is, a, this is a picture of my dad and I on a fishing trip that we took when I was 11. And, uh, you know, my dad was my hero, right? He was the president of Little League. We played catch every single day. I was 12 years old at the time, and, and I would come home. I wanted to be just like my dad. And uh, I was now at an age where, you know, he would take me and we'd hang out. And I felt like I was an adult. He was teaching me how to change the oil. Uh, my mom, my mom was my favorite person for a whole different reason. Here's a, a picture. I was, I was actually really young here. Um, but I love my mom and, and she volunteered at the school uh, in a reading program. I'm, I didn't have a reading disability, but I did have reading comprehension issues. So I was put into a special reading class uh, in, in, in school. And, and she volunteered at the elementary school and started a reading program that made learning visual. And, and what it showed me and what it taught me is that you can be different. You can struggle in certain aspects of your life, but there's, you still have purpose. You still have a place and you can still contribute and people can still like you. Wait, 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 wait. So I can be different. Maybe not as good as everyone over here, but I can still maybe be good over here and find a place and a purpose. That's a powerful thing to accept differences when you're young. So when my father killed my mom, um, I came home. Uh, my sister and I lived in a temporary foster home for about eight months to finish up the school year. And then eventually my aunt, who's my mom's sister, uh, she got custody of my sister and I. And in that time frame, we went through probably the most intense therapy you could possibly imagine. And within it, that's exactly what happened is I learned how to visualize. I want to show you guys this. This is a, a picture of me when I was at that age when we moved in with my aunt. That's my aunt in the middle. And then that's my sister right there. 
So now my aunt, who guess what, is now a, a 32-year-old single woman, owns her own business, has her own condo, going on girls' trips, no kids at the time, she gets my sister and I. And she did it with such open arms. There's never a discussion on where we would go. She wanted to raise her sister's kids. So I'm very thankful for that. I think in therapy, we learned a lot. We learned about uh, what, what does it mean to forgive? What, what does it mean? What is maybe the perception of it? And what do you want to define it as? Uh, the ability to have closure and to move on from different aspects of your life and, and the ability to visualize and, and talk to yourself and not listen to yourself. And that when you're at the crossroads in life and when you're face down, and, and I know this, every one of us can relate to this moment. When we're face down in the dirt or we're in the water and we feel like we're drowning and we just need a second to tread water and catch our breath. We can all relate to that moment. doesn't matter what color you are, what race you are, how much money you have. None of that matters. But the moment of struggle is real. We can all relate to it. But the decision that we make in that moment, do we rise? Do we fall? Do we live in vision? Do we stay in circumstance and make excuses? To me, that's what separates us. And the ability to talk to ourselves, the ability to talk ourselves out of it and not listen to the voice of doubt, excuse, and, and quitting, to me, that's such a powerful thing, man. Tell yourself where you want to go. And amazingly enough, you'll surround yourself with the energies and the people that have those same views and you rise and you lift each other up. And the next thing you know, man, you're having closure with these difficult aspects of your life and you're allowing yourself to see the open door of positivity and, and go get the world. You've always had a lot of confidence though. So I feel like before that happened, there must have been something inside you that was also just kind of this drive and this, and were you very goal oriented and you were very driven and, and you had a kind of an inner confidence or did that come from the therapy? You know, I, I think it came from the therapy. I think it came, um, you know, we, we, we did what's called experiential therapy, which means you dive into it. You know, this is, this is pretty deep here. My sister and I, uh, my therapist wanted us to view the autopsy photos and everybody thought he was crazy. And wow. so what happened, yeah, what happened is the trial took place. And the autopsy photos uh, were shown in a way that only the jurors could see. Uh, my dad in, in Seattle, his trial had a ton of news coverage. And so there were cameras everywhere. Uh, but needless to say, we weren't able to see the pictures. And so my therapist actually went to court and got a private court order for two minors to have a private sitting and viewing of an autopsy photo. My sisters and I, my sister and I became the first um, minors to have a, a court order for that. Everybody thinks he's crazy. So here's what happens. We drive to the, uh, we drive to the prosecutor's office. We sit in his office. I'll never forget this. I was 13, 13 years old and uh, 12, 13 years old. She walks in and she puts a folder on the, on the desk. She leaves. And the therapist looked at my sister and I, and he said this, everybody thinks I'm crazy that I want you guys to see these pictures. But you know what the, the reality is? I don't really care. But why should it be anybody else's decision but yours? This is your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. You want to look, look, you don't, don't. And I, I'll never ask. I don't care. And just as he was about to leave the, the, the room, he opened the door and he peeked back in. And I'll never forget this. He says, but if for whatever reason you decide to ever want to talk to your dad again, and I know that doesn't sound very popular right now, but I know the way the world works. You might be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. You might have kids, you might not. If you ever decide that you want to see your dad and you decide to look at those pictures, It'll be for far more powerful reasons than just wanting to know what happened. Because that kid right there, that is what happened. And there's nobody that can tell you anything else because you're going to see it for your own eyes. It's your choice. And he walked out and, and I looked at the pictures. And I think from that moment on, I just had this appreciation for life. I, I almost had this guilt of wanting to bring pride back to my last name. I, I almost had this... Um, Guilt might be the wrong word, but I, I had this internal feeling of I wanted to achieve so much more because I'm alive and my mom's not. And there's so much in this world I can do to make her proud and make my family proud. And then I started seeing people help me, my aunt and uncle, the therapist, people in the community, uh, the Seattle Mariners, and just all these different people were coming and helping my sister and I. Uh, you know, people actually, sometimes they laugh, but I'll play Kenny G at the house, right? I sit by the fire outside, I play Kenny G, and they're like, John, are you listening to Kenny G right now? <laughs> my, my sister loved Kenny G. And she played the saxophone and she wrote him a letter and I'm going to get choked up and I'll never forget that dude wrote her back when she was 15 years old. Wow. And she still has that letter. And to make that difference, um, I'm forever a Kenny G fan. I love it. Um, sure. You know, when I became a professional athlete and I had the ability to do just that, to write back, to pull a kid out of the crowd and play catch or, or to help a, a make a wish. I literally thought of that moment and what he did for my sister. And it was so cool. So um, 
you know, the ability to, how do you say thank you to these people that sacrificed for you? Well, I'll tell you how. You, you pass it on and you continue to live a life that, that they can watch you grow and realize how proud they are of you for doing everything that you did. So at some point, you dove into magic, I know, around this time as well. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, actually, ironically, th this is a guy right here, Bill Malone. He's a huge, uh, this guy was on TV. It was a show called The World's Greatest Magic. He was a card guy, right? And this guy shuffled cards. He would tell a story. Uh, and this just like, man, it hit me. I had just seen a 16-year-old magician named Michael Groves in person. Uh, so I was now 13. Uh, I saw a magician for the first time. He was a 16-year-old kid, did a trick, blew my mind. And here's what I learned. And I didn't realize it until I was older. But as I would sit down and shuffle cards, right, I would hear that, that, that sound, that riffle, and it would, it would put me at ease. And what I didn't realize at the time is that shuffling cards was the only time I felt like I was just a kid. Shuffling cards made me forget everything around me. And so as a kid, I spent years working on these tricks and these moves, and I wouldn't really do tricks for anybody because it wasn't about that for me at the time. It was my escape. It was the ability to just let my mind go at ease, forget about losing not just my mom, but my mom and my dad, right? All my friends that I left behind, moving in with my aunt and just finding this new life. This was the only thing that made me forget everything. And ironically, when I would shuffle is when my mind freed itself and I started to dream and I started to kind of visualize where I wanted to be in my life and the things I wanted to do. I wanted to have two jobs. I wanted to be a magician. I don't want to play pro sports. And guess what? The only two jobs I've ever had, performing and football. And at the highest level. And so- you know, I, I remember speaking of, speaking of shuffling cards, one of the first times we hung out, we got on a plane, we went to Bend, Oregon, we hung out with your friend Drew Bledsoe. We we're in a bar on a weekend night. It was snowing like crazy. There's like almost nobody in the bar, but Drew and his brother and some of his friends and family were there. And you like mesmerized like five people, including myself, for, I think it was like two hours, just doing trick after trick. Maybe it was 30 minutes, but it felt like a, an entire show and every trick blew everybody away. It was unbelievable. So you obviously became a master and I know you did well before you even got into the pro you know, NFL league, you were already doing professional magic in Vegas, right? At a yeah. very young age. When, when was the youngest, when, when, did, when was it that you, that you really were a professional at first? Well, I guess technically a professional is you make money, right? I right. guess that's the defining characteristic of what makes you a pro. Right. Uh, I was 15 and uh, I, wow. I, I started, an agency started booking me. Uh, back then it was an agency called Jam Entertainment and uh, they started booking me to do close-up stuff. And I was, I was a walk around magician at like corporate events. Now, when I was 15, 16, I, I looked a little older. I was kind of like the man child. So I looked like I was 18, 19, you know, 20. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where I first got my start doing walk around corporate magic at like luncheons and dinners. Amazing. And so then you, I, I feel like you might've used your magical abilities and the, the sleight of hand, the amazing ability to use your hands magically to create a video to get yourself <laughs> into uh, uh, UTEP, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm tell guilty. Us that so, story real quick. Yeah. So basically what happened is, uh, I, I thought I was a great high school player, right? Led the league in tackles. I was a stud, no scholarships, nothing. So I was like, man. So there's a couple of junior colleges around here and some of them were recruiting me, but they had like hundred guys on the team. So there was a, a school down the road called the Golden West Junior College in Huntington Beach, California. They were 0-30, which means the previous three seasons, they hadn't won a game. They lost every game for three years. Now, what does this guy think? If I can't play there, I can't play anywhere. So why not be a big fish and a small pond, baby? So I go to Golden West, I start, I do really well, or at least in my mind I did, uh, after my freshman year, no scholarships. So I was like, man. So my best friend, Paul Tessier, uh, was at UTEP, University of Texas El Paso. He hit me up and said, hey, we need a long snapper. And I had snapped a little bit in high school. So what I did is I took my highlights and I made a highlight, team, uh, a highlight tape of myself, and it was pretty good. Then I got Nick Heinley. Now, Nick Heinley was number 48. Uh, I was number 47 at the time. Uh, we were both kind of, we looked the same on film. But he was just like crushing hits, right? So I took some of his big hits and I spliced it in with like my finesse and running and open field tackles. But they need a long snapper and I didn't have any footage of me snapping. So we had Tim Thurman, a 6'6 long snapper. So I took his snapping, put it on my film and said it was me. And then I sent it out and then I put some of my high school snapping on there from years prior. And lo and behold, I got a full ride to the University of Texas El Paso, baby. 
and I was a long snapper there for three years. And, and all I told myself is I want to play division one football. I want to run out. So, so for me wanting to play college football, I had a choice between baseball and football. Baseball was a little slow. And so for me, this is how simple this is. The only, and I kid you not, the real reason I wanted to play college football is I wanted to be a rock star, right? But I can't sing, I can't dance, and I can't play an instrument. So check that off. But I wanted to run out of a tunnel in front of 100,000 people. Think about that. College football. So what happens? First game, we play Oklahoma. 90, I think it was 98,602 people in Oklahoma. So it's just shy, just shy of 100,000. But I got to run out of the tunnel. Uh, I eventually made the pros. And we played in Dallas at the new stadium. And it held 105,000 people. And I'll never forget, I got to run out of a tunnel in front of 100,000 people like I had always wanted to since I was a freshman in high school. Now, it was 105,000 people booing me, but nonetheless, it was still 105,000 people. Just one of the first many check marks that you made, you know, checking off your goals in life. And did they ever find out, by the way, that you spliced yourself and three other people together to make this video to get in? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I told them. I think it was my senior year or something like that. And then there's been stories done on my life here. Uh, so, yeah, I told them. And, and now I had footage of me on there. I had Paul Tessier, who was my best friend, who was already playing there, that vouched for me. And then I had that footage. So it was kind of like the perfect storm. I just needed to, like, package it and just say, here I am, take me. Right. And, it, and then and you had, worked. like, how long, like, two weeks to actually learn how to do this before you went in person? A couple months. I, I, oh. I actually, I did, I did have a couple months, thank okay. goodness, to kind of just freshen up a little bit. So I was able to do that. And then uh, I transferred out and played my sophomore, junior, and senior year at the uh, University of Texas, El Paso. And then you went to the Bills, where you met Bledsoe. Yep. He was your quarterback. Then you went to the Tennessee Titans, where you played for Air McNair, Steve McNair, yep. legend. And then you went to Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, I'm going to show you all this. Eagles. Yeah, I, I spent most of my career with these guys, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. So this is me. Um, you know, we, I think we actually kind of need to go back a little bit because there's a lot of people that actually might not know I was a long snapper in the NFL for 15 years. Now, this is the position I would assume. Now, what's funny about this, these are McFarland figures. These are actually kind of expensive. Uh, and so I had somebody say, John, you got a McFarland figure? No, actually, this is actually Kevin Mawai. And a fan bought this and sanded it down <laughs> and hand-painted hand it to be me. So Kevin Mawai is an all-pro center. But a fan did this and painted it to be me. Um, so I, I, Yeah, to back up so people know, I, I was a long snapper. So basically, that's me right there. And it was my job to snap a football and hit that guy right in the leg. And so when this whole thing happens, basically I take a ball, I look between my legs, I throw it to him, and then boom, he kicks it, right? And now a lot of people are like, well, that, that doesn't look that hard. I mean, it's not like you get hit. Hold on, Montrer. So that's the guy that I would go against. And usually the guys that I would go against would be anywhere from a foot to two, three feet taller. And basically what happens is as soon <laughs> as I move, that guy can try and run me over, and I have to try and block him from blocking the kick. <laughs> That there is the X factor that makes that job really, really hard. So here's what happens. That right there, that's a clip where I look like a stud. This guy's way bigger than me. I crush him. I pound him. I do my job. It's all good. Every once in a while, you get put into a situation, okay? And I'm going to show you this right now, that there's a guy uh, lined across from me to the right, and every once in a while, this happens, where you just get absolutely pummeled and ran over. Like <laughs> now... Uh, thank you, Chris. I, I appreciate you laughing because just so you know, I did not find that funny. I'm a Cowboys <laughs> fan. So, you know, <laughs> oh, that's, you know what? Interview done. I'm out. <laughs> and, uh, for those that don't know, the, uh, the Cowboys are the big rivals with the Eagles where I spent most of my career. Um, but you know what? Th this is this is the point of this clip, right? Sometimes in life, you do everything great, right? You take on the, you take on the challenge in front of you, you smash it. Life has its plan and, and you have your plan. and It's all in sync. And then every once in a while, you just get hit. Right? You just get knocked down, right? All of a sudden, the, the deck gets shuffled in crazy ways and things are out of order because this is what I learned, that it's not about, it's like what Rocky said, it's not about how hard you get hit. It's about getting up. It's about being able to put your life back in order. I, can, I, can I actually show you guys a, a trick here? So I, I got a multi-cam thing going on. So I already have, a, I, I took a deck of cards and um, I already got out all the spades. So here they are. Uh, and this is important. I want everybody to notice this. Uh, these cards have been shuffled. And as you guys can all see, these spades are not in order because the reality is sometimes in life, we think that we're on a path. We think that we know where we want to go and we think that we have a plan. And then all of a sudden life happens and all of a sudden our life gets shuffled. And now before you know it, we are all of a sudden out of order. So here we are. The idea here is that sometimes we have to take a deep breath 
and we have to sit back and just learn how to talk to ourselves so that we can make sense of our life. We can have closure, we can have forgiveness, and we can all of a sudden learn to talk to ourselves, not listen to ourselves, but talk to ourselves and figure out how to put our lives back in order. Like I said, it's not about how hard wow. we get hit. It's the ability to stand back up. It's the ability to talk to ourselves. It's the ability to not let the obstacles in life hold us down and dictate who we are. So now if this is me and I'm in order, well, guess what? <laughs> I guess this is all of you, right? So now we all got to get on the same page. So sometimes let's just give these guys a shuffle and check this out. Now we have a deck of cards. And as you can still see, they are out of order. So may every one of us just take a moment, take a deep breath, look in the mirror, talk to yourself, tell yourself where you wanna be, and just put yourself back in order. Wow. I believe that, but it starts between the eyes. It's not about getting knocked over, it's not about getting ran over, because that's gonna happen. I tell you this, everybody asks me, John, do you ever have a concussion? You play football 25 years, guess what? You're gonna have a concussion. John, do you ever get ran over? You play football 25 years, guess what you're, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get ran over. But this is just like life. The longer that we get to live, the more that we're going to experience, the more that we can overcome. Look, scars, I love scars. God, you know what? Let's quote the great Shane Falco in virtually speaking, chicks dig scars, pain heals, glory, lasts forever, replacements. What a great quote from a quarterback in a movie. But that's the reality, right? Pain heals. And that scar glory, lasts forever is like the last chapter kind of of you know or one of the more recent chapters of your life right that's from the uh the trade so you you were you were playing for the eagles you know i'm a cowboy fan so thankfully you guys never won the super bowl <laughs> you guys beat us in the playoffs we beat you as well but you came to i guess it was a couple years ago a point where you 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 had already been on america's got talent at that point is that correct yeah, so I just, I finished America's Got Talent. Um, I, I was a finalist. I, I finished in the top three. Uh, and then what happened is I, I then became the following season. Uh, I then became the franchise holder for the most consecutive games ever played in Eagles history, which I thought was really, really cool. And so at this time going into training camp, I, I did not expect to get the news that the Eagles said, hey, John, uh, we just want to let you know, but we're looking to trade you. Wow. I'm sorry. Wait, I have the most consecutive games I've ever played. I've been here for 11 years, never missed a game. I feel like I'm Mr. Eagle. I feel like I'm going to retire here. But here's what happens. This is a trip, right? So here we go. Here we go. Here is I had a plan, but you know what? Life happens. So the GM comes up to me and says, John, we're going to trade you. And I think he thought that I was going to be upset. And internally, I was because I felt like I was the best guy for the job for that city at that moment. But now here is the moment that I think separates who we are as people. That was my reality. I had two choices. I can fight it, be angry and bitter and almost forget the 11 years and the good times I had with an organization that meant so much to me. Or I can accept it for what it is, be thankful for the opportunities that I had and realize that I need to come to terms with what my reality is so that way I can find the upside as soon as possible. And so what happens? The Eagles trade me to the New Orleans Saints uh, where I was able to play there. Uh, I actually... Uh, uh, when, when this whole thing happened, it's actually kind of funny. I, I told the GM, I go, wait, you're wanting to trade me? He goes, yeah. Excuse me, but uh, has there ever in the history of the NFL been a long snapper traded for? Now, my position, we usually get cut and, and hired. We don't get traded, right? <laughs> now, when I came into the NFL, I was a free agent, which means I was not drafted. The draft was over. And now there's just a ton of us in the world. And the team called me and said, hey, do you want to come up here and try out for the team? Probably not make it. And I said, I would love to. So I, I didn't really have a lot of value coming out of college well, wait a minute, now you're going to trade me when I'm in my 15th season and they're going to give a draft pick for me? I got traded for more than I was even when I got in the league. I was worth more then than I was 15 years ago. That's the way I told my Well, friend. you made two Pro Bowls, right? Yeah, I, I did make two Pro Bowls, which is, which is really cool. And, and also I was uh, – <clears throat> excuse I don't want to – I didn't want to have to bring this up, but if you're going to make <laughs> me fine. Uh, I was on the 2014 All-Fundamentals team. I was a captain with Peyton Manning. Look, I'll be honest with you. I have no idea what that even means, but I got a phone call from somebody and they sent me this, this, this like uh, silver helmet and this trophy and um, first team all fundamentals. So I have no idea what it means, but <laughs> put that We're on. We're fundamentally sound. Yeah, right? So, so here's the point, right? So here's what happens. I had an opportunity to fight it, right? I even got a phone call from the organization that says, hey, if you don't want to go, play here one more year and, and then retire an Eagle. 
And I sat back from myself and I said, wait, something's going on. And you know what? Obviously, there's some coaches here that, that want to go younger. And so maybe this is the right move. Maybe my life is just pushing me in a different direction. So what happens is I go to New Orleans. I play in a game. The next day, the doctors flew in. I did my physical. So when you get traded, you have to go through a physical, right? Because the new team wants to make sure that you're healthy and that you're good to go. And, and you're an asset. And they just want to make sure their asset is good to go. And when I did that physical, the doc put a stethoscope uh, on my chest. And sure enough, he was like, hey, something doesn't really sound right. We're going to go ahead and send you down to the hospital and get, a, get, get some tests done. So I had what's called an echocardiogram done. Uh, and all of a sudden, the results came back. And it wasn't what we were expecting at all. This is actually my echocardiogram right there. Uh, this is the aorta. And that circle should be that size. And so what happened is, is I had a, the vein that leaves the heart should be about the size of a dime or a nickel. And I had what's called an ascending aortic aneurysm, which is actually this right here. So the blood that leaves the heart, uh, the vein that carries the blood out of the heart, it was blowing up like a water balloon in this one segment, Oof. which means if that pops, right, if that pops, you're, you're dead instantly before you even hit the ground. So uh, sure enough, my entire life kind of flashed before me. And it's the story you tell yourself. And this is why this is important. That's my guy right there. That, that's a guy by the name of Drew Brees. <laughs> and at the, moment, at the moment that I found out this news, one, I got a phone call from the hospital as I, as I was getting ready for practice. Um, hey, John, you're never playing football ever again. And you're going to be in emergency open heart surgery probably in the next 48 hours. Now, keep in mind, I'm 37 years old. I just signed a three-year extension for more money than I'd ever seen. I got traded to a team that wears all black, which is slimming for a 37-year-old pudgy guy. Yeah, was, <laughs> there was just all these things checking off the lift that were positive. So to hear that my career was over, it wasn't the way that I planned on going out. I had worked my whole life for this. That's not the yeah. way I'm going out. And so here, here comes that moment. The narrative you tell yourself, the story you tell yourself, the words, they mean something. <clears throat> I sat down on my stool. And I remember in 2006, I was going out to a game and a reporter named Joe Santaliquido stopped me and said, hey, John, is it true that your mom's best friend sang Wind Beneath My Wings at her funeral? And I was like, whoa, yeah, yeah, that's true. He goes, unbelievable, man. I read your life. You bounced around, but you're an eagle now. And the song says, I can fly higher than an eagle because you are the wind beneath my wings. Wow. I wish, he goes, I wish you all the best, kid. We're pulling for you. Play hard. The city's going to love you. And may the wind always be beneath your wings. Wow. So in the moment I found out I was having heart surgery, I thought of that guy. I thought of Joe and what he said to me. And then Drew Brees walks by me. And I realized that the story in the moment that I tell myself is going to be what differentiates where I'm going and how I'm going to live. And I remember going, man, I had the wind beneath my wings for all these years. My mom traded me from up above. She had a plan. She sent me to the New Orleans Saints. She sent me to have my life saved by a saint. And all she's telling me is, hey, you got to step out of the wind, kid, and catch a breeze. And Drew Brees was my breeze. And I, I truly believe that that saved my life. So uh, that was me right after surgery. Um, I'm now part of what's called the Zipper Club. Uh, my surgery was uh, about 11 and a half hours. Um, I spent over 30 days post-surgery in the hospital. I had hematomas, white blood cell issues, and some other stuff going on. Valve, valve, leaky valves replacements and uh, changed my life, man. And uh, at the time, I was newly married. I had been married for about a month at that time. Wow. And uh, my wife, who is by far the coolest person in the world, if I didn't leave that bed, she didn't leave that bed. So here you go. That's me and my wife right there on a beach in Cabo, baby. So that's when we got <laughs> married uh, about a month prior. And I kid you not, I love this woman more than anything. And uh, um, I'm so happy that she was able to sit by my side in the hospital and, and kind of bring me back to life. Yeah, that's amazing. It's an amazing story. And, you know, there's going to be people who hear your story and they're going to say, wow, your mom was taken away from you. The dream of you know being with the eagles and the eagles ended up winning the super bowl that year that you well, were training. we gotta back up okay i, I want to give somebody a perspective here okay okay now, i'm in the sports world so like i'm an athlete i want to win the super bowl right that's what we work for yeah the, the eagles go to the super bowl in 2005 2004 2005 okay. so what happens is the next year they sign john dornboss that's this guy i play in every game for 11 years that's the record okay set the record for the most consecutive games ever played. And then they get to a point where they're like, yeah, let's trade John. <laughs> so then they trade me and then they went back to the Super Bowl. I basically played every single game between the two Super Bowl appearances of that organization. And so I was a little bit like, you've got to be flipping. But you got him ready. Me. You got him ready to be able, you got them ready, just ready enough to win it. And then 
the great story here is that the owner of the team, who was a very good friend of yours, a big fan of yours, ended up making sure you got the ring. Um, probably one of the one of the coolest things that's that's happened to me. So uh, this is it right here. It, it sits on my shelf, and and I look at it, and uh, basically the the Eagles called me and said, hey. We know this whole thing went down. This is just unbelievable. So if we go to the Super Bowl, we're going to invite you. Sure enough, they go to the game. They invite my wife and I. I sit in, I sit in the suite. And uh, the night before the game, where he came to me and said, hey, we're going to win this, and you're going to get a player's ring. And it's important for you to understand that you're getting a player's ring because of what you did for this organization for so long and how you helped set the culture. And so when he presented me the ring, you know, it takes a little while for the ring to get in. Um, I'll, I'll never forget that the organization and Mr. Lurie said, hey, when you look at this ring, though you might not have played, may you always remember how much work it took. May you always remember the relationships. May you always remember the greatness that you learned from all the great coaches and players and executives that you were able to surround yourself with. And uh, keep working hard, man, because you deserve this. And um, I think for me, you know, uh, people ask me, John, what was your goal when you were a player? And I, I did an interview early on in my career. My goal is I want to be, look, I want to run out in front of 100,000 people, right? And I wanted to be the oldest guy on the team. And if people would be like, really? Oh, this kind of team? Like, why? Well, if my goal is to win a Super Bowl, what happens if I win a Super Bowl my rookie year and then I never play again? Well, that's not, right? But if I'm the oldest guy in the team, I'm going to give myself the most chances and the most opportunities to have success. And if I'm the oldest guy in the team, that means that the guy that's writing the check to keep me there values me. It means I'm showing up every day on time and ready to work. I, I tell the youth this. If you want to be a champion, it's very, very easy. Show up on time, prepared, and ready to work. Show up with passion, show up with dedication, show up with commitment, show up with the ability to process constructive criticism, maybe set the ego aside every once in a while and realize that when people are, are telling you things and criticizing you, sometimes it's to make you better. Sometimes it's what you need to hear to grow. So, so really, this is what it all came down to. So uh, look, I got a king of clubs. Um, this is a, a business card. I, I, it's, I love this. It's inspired by Danny Ocean Promotions 11, just my name and my face. I never carry these on me, but it's cool. Um, I, got a, I got a dollar bill right here, and then I got a box of cards. Uh, for me, life has been about this. It's about finding balance, right? It's about the ability to process, have closure, take the constructive criticism, and do all this. And also, maybe just find yourself a little balance. Chris, you and I have talked about this over the years. And hold on. People have asked me what I've been doing during the quarantine. I've been spending way too much time trying to do this. Oh, wow. Find, find balance in your life. Find peace, find closure. Take a second to look at yourself in the mirror and find out what are my two palm trees? Where do I want to be? And that's one way that we can balance ourselves and just stack ourselves up, put ourselves back together. I love that. That's what I've been working on during this quarantine. And some people might say, well, gee, John, that's a big waste of time. And well, it is. It looks really cool on camera though. Well, that's the goal, right? Yeah. Well, amazing. All of this is so amazing. And I think that also in the last couple of years, not only have you been traded, which saved your life, the trade saved your life. If, if it wouldn't, if you wouldn't have been traded to the New Orleans Saints, what would have happened? You would have been just playing football and, and that thing would have burst or? Yeah, so basically I was told that every time I hit the field, I had a higher chance of, of dying than I did living. And I was basically one big hit in the chest away from that rupturing. And, um, you know, they say that when your aorta ruptures, it's usually two or three seconds. So you're dead before you hit the ground and there is no coming back. And so um, that, would have been a, that would have been a bad day. Thank, thank God you only played – Long snappers only play what 30 seconds, 35 seconds total a game. Yeah, right. So it's actually kind of funny because I've had three wrist surgeries, four hernias, knee surgery, 14 years in the league. Average plays like anywhere between two and six seconds. Maybe you play 10 seconds, uh, 10 plays a game. So you're looking at maybe a minute. So, like in 14 years, I played like 22 minutes of actual football. <laughs> right? So, my injury to play ratio is way off. <laughs> but I was going to say, one, one of the other things that also happened last couple of years, you were on America's Got Talent. You were Simon Cowell's favorite contestant. You came in third place. You made it to the finals. Then you went back again and did the champions, right? Yeah. But you, but you also met your dad. Yeah, so this is super intense. And so I'm going to go back to, to this picture right here. So that's my wife when she was pregnant. And she was just about to, uh, to be due. 
And I specifically remember looking at her saying, hey, honey, you know, I've, I've been thinking about my life and, and there's three words that I've never said out loud. I've never said, I forgive you. And so now all of a sudden became probably the biggest life lesson that I've ever learned in this life is that if we can find motivation within defeat, if we can take all these negative feelings that we have and find a way to internalize them and find motivation, what a powerful thing that is. And so what happens is I realized that about a, a few weeks or a month before my daughter was due was the time for me to sit down with my dad. So I flew to where he lived. Uh, I hadn't seen him in 27 years. When did, he he get, down. when did he get out of prison? Yeah, so he went in in 1992. Um, and he was, at the time, it was second degree murder. Uh, he was sentenced to 13 years, and I believe he served 11. And so uh, back, you know, in, in the state of Washington, second degree murder, max, max penalty uh, was, was 13 years. And so he was released around, let's do the math, if he did 11, 93, so around 2004, 2005. And I went to go see him in 2019. So he was out for, for quite a while. Did he reach out so, to you during that, during that time? No. No, and, and that was part of the deal when, when he went to prison was, hey, you know, we all part ways. And everybody yeah. agreed. And, and um, you know, it was probably what was best for everybody. And so I, I hit him up and said, hey, if you want to meet, I don't want anything from you. And uh, if you just want to sit. He hit me back and said, I was waiting for your time to be right. And uh, let's do it. And so here I am. I'm on a plane to go see my dad. And what I was, was this? This was two years uh, ago? This was a year ago. A year. Actually, my daughter just turned one. So it was like a year and a month. So 13 months ago. Okay. Um, and here we are. It was the moment that I had in New Orleans when I was sitting on the stool and I found out I was having heart surgery. And I thought of my man, Joe Santaliquido, saying I had the wind beneath my wings. Well, now I'm on a plane. I'm heading to go see my dad. I look out the window and I heard my therapist tell me. And it was me sitting at a table for the autopsy folks. And he said, if you look and you want to go see your dad, it's going to be for a much more powerful reason than just wanting to know what happened. And I remember that. And I remember, I remember saying to myself, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have any questions. I don't want validation. I'm not looking for answers. I'm literally going there to forgive them. Like, this is crazy. And then all of a sudden people say, John, that's crazy. How do you forgive your dad for that? Well, it goes back to redefining what that, what that means, right? So forgiveness for a lot of people is bitterness. It's, it's one upping, it's winning and losing. It's, it's, if I forgive you, that means I agree with what you did and I'm okay with what you did. For me, that's not what it means. For me, forgiveness means I'm okay with who I am. I'm okay with my past. I'm okay with where I'm going. And you know what else I'm okay with? I'm okay waking up tomorrow and realizing that you're no longer in my life, nor have you been, and nor will you be going forward. A lot of people, bad things happen to them. It happens to all of us. And, and I think a lot of us can relate to our, our friends get divorced, right? And one of them is so bitter for so long. The reality is when you get divorced, that person is no longer in your life. So if you live every day with bitterness, thinking of that person, you're wasting your own time. So now it comes back to have closure, right? Be okay with change. Be okay with saying goodbye to a good or bad time in your life and looking forward to what the next chapter is. And so for me, when I sat down with my dad for five and a half hours, um, I realized that I was sitting there because I wanted to relive that entire part of my life, the emotion, the anger, the resentment. I wanted to literally sit and look at my dad and say, who are you? And, and what did we miss out on? All this in my own head. What could have been, what should have been? Where did you go wrong? And then I realized that at the end when I stood up and I said, hey, I, I really came here to say, I forgive you for being lost and I forgive you for making a mistake. And as I was flying home, I realized I wanted to relive the worst part of my life to find motivation and more excitement to be the dad to my little girl that I never had and to be there. You know, I, I never got to have lunch with my dad, right? I never, as an adult, I never got to sit and have lunch with my dad. And if you, uh, if you happen to want to read this, um, I'm going to open the dedication uh, because the dedication is so, it's, this was probably my favorite thing that I wrote in this book. It says, uh, for Annalise, who turned my heart right side up, and Amaya, who's my little girl, uh, you will always be able to have lunch with your daddy. And that's, always being- That's your book, Life is Magic. Yeah, that's my book, Life is Magic. And it's, it's the journey of finding forgiveness um, that, that I've searched for my whole life. And- you know, what's funny is when I found forgiveness and I, and I forgave my dad, I got so excited to be a dad. I got so excited to be everything that I didn't have. And there's a choice, right? Look at this choice. I could have become what I came from and I could have replicated what I despised, which we all know people that do that. And they don't even realize that they're going down that path, but they become what they hated. Or 
I can lay the hammer down, lay the law down and change it and be better, be better to my wife, be better to my daughter, be better to myself than what I had experienced and what I came for. And uh, that's the decision that I made. I'm going to be the dad that I never had. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's real talk right there, man. Yeah. And, and a lot of people today really need to learn forgiveness. A lot of people you know, are hurting. Yeah. And, and I think what it is, is um, for me, forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person anymore. It isn't about one-upping. It's not about winning and losing. It's, are you ready for this? It's not about me saying, I agree with you. It's about me stepping back and saying, I'm at peace with this and I'm going to live my life. And the negativity of this situation is not going to affect me going forward. Right. So I forgave my dad for being lost. I forgave him for making a mistake because both of which I've done many of, and I can relate to that. But now I wake up and I don't have this cloud of bitterness. I don't have hate. I don't have any of this blocking my brain anymore and just kind of coming in there. Uh, this was very powerful. I, I read a thing by, uh, it was an interview of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, a lot of people are familiar with his story. He went to prison uh, and he said something interesting. He said, I went to prison and I, I gathered the inmates and I said, hey, if, if the guards do not capture our souls and we keep our souls for ourselves, we are free men. So what happens? They build this wall, right? And they come together, there's unity. Well, Nelson Mandela gets out of prison. And he, he said that I didn't go to prison until I was released because my mind got so bitter at the time lost that I was out of prisoner. I was out of prison as a free man, but yet I was so bitter that I was living with bitter and anger at time lost. And I had to get rid of that to really free myself. The guy said he didn't go to prison until he was released wow. because of his own mind and bitterness. Wow. Think about that. That's amazing. It's the ability to let go and have peace and, and, and clarity in your mind. To me, that's what forgiveness is. And what is Life is Magic? I'm, I'm sure you've got your own definition of the title of your book. What does that mean for you? Um, you know, it's, it was one of those things that, uh, one, I'm a magician, so similar to virtually speaking, little play on words. Uh, but two is the magic for me in life is the story you tell yourself. It's the things you want to become. It's the narrative. It's, um, you know, so my mom, uh, when she was killed, um, my grandparents and my aunt, they all flew down to the house and my mom had a jewelry box. Inside of that jewelry box was three chains with uh, little medallions on it. And she was going to give it to my sister, my brother and I, when we all turned 18, that was going to be, Hey, you're 18. Here you go. Here's a gift for me. Well, none of us had reached that age yet. And so uh, I got it right away and I wore it. And to me, that was me being close to my mom. So I moved down to Southern California. I go to Huntington beach. I jump in the ocean. And when I come out, the necklace is gone. I was mortified. Like I literally was crushed, cried. I went back a couple of days in a row looking for this thing. And then finally I realized this is the magic right here. This is life is magic. I changed the story. And I looked up in the sky and I kind of laughed at myself and I said, mom, I get it. That necklace was never for me. You know what it was? I was just the vehicle that took it from Seattle down to Southern California to lay it in the ocean where it belongs. Cause I know you wanted to travel the world. So I know that my necklace, it probably wrapped around a dolphin. And you know what happened is that dolphin swam and it fell off and then it, it hit the whale's back and the whale took it to Hawaii. And then, you know what? I think a sea turtle took it over took it over to Australia. And now this thing's been around the world. And uh, now that necklace has such a better meaning than just wrapped around my neck. Now, every time I see the ocean, I know my mom's been there and that's now where I go talk to her. And I, I believe that she's there. That right there, yeah. that's life is magic. And you've gone around the world as, a, as an NFL player, as a magician. I think on your finals or your champions uh, competition uh, for the America's Got Talent episode where you did your magic, you, you talked about how you've been to all these different cities and you had yeah. them all pick a different city that you wanted to go to. And so you've really, yep. have you been all over the world as a performer at this point? Yeah, it's, it's been good. Like we've, we've been able to go a lot of really, really cool places. And uh, you know, the, the advantage of being a, a speaker um, is you're able to go to these really cool islands. You're able to go to these retreats and you're able to hang out with some, some really, really cool people. Uh, you had just mentioned um, the America's Got Talent. So I'm going to, I'm going to do something here. Um, that is going to wrap up uh, kind of what my life is. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, when a magician comes out and has a custom card box with his logo. That's never good. Engraved, right? And then when he opens it and a small stack of cards gets dumped out, let me tell you right now, 
if that doesn't scream trick deck, I don't know what does. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is uh, this is what I, I truly believe in, and I'll, I'll explain why this is kind of perceived as a trick deck in just a second. Um, within my life, you asked me what life is magic is. Magic actually taught me how to find myself. And uh, it taught me don't hate, don't blame, and forgive. And what I think is super powerful is that here we have a stack. Now, these cards are blank, um, and that's why people think they're a trick deck. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take three blanks and set them over each queen like so. Like this and like this. I know this, that before I really believed in the therapy that I was doing, before I kind of experienced life, the more I hated, the more I lost myself bit by bit, piece by piece, gone. I think a lot of people, we blame a lot of things around us. We make excuses, right? But the reality is, is the more we blame, the more we lose ourselves piece by piece, bit by bit, gone. Forgiveness. Mm. Wow. What a powerful thing forgiveness is. Now, look, I didn't really know what forgiveness was until I got older and until I kind of experienced life. But I know this, when I grew up and I held grudges, and I know that the more grudges I held, guess what? The more I lost myself piece by piece, bit by bit, gone. So life is magic because this. May every one of us hate a little less. Whoa. May every one of us blame a little less. And may every one of us just forgive just a little bit more. And this world is a powerful, powerful place. Amen. That's amazing. And confidence is a big part of it all as well. Where do you get it from? You know, uh, I've always just had this desire to live. I've, I've never really been scared of failure. I, I've, I've been scared of not showing up. I've been scared of not giving it my all. Um, to me, if I fail, that's part of life, right? And I, I can live with that. If, if I give it everything I have and I, I practice and I prepare and it just doesn't work out, hey, that comes back to guess what? That's just life. Um, it's also, this is kind of funny. It's also the narrative. So as a snapper, um, believe it or not, I actually feel like in 06 and 07, it's kind of when I felt like my career, I was starting to get to be pretty good as a snapper, right? It took me a few years to figure it out. Uh, I, I actually pretend, don't ask me why, okay? But like, I always pretended I was like Matt Damon in a movie <laughs> and I was acting like the greatest snapper in the world. Well, okay, if I'm the greatest snapper in the world, what would that guy be like? And I acted like who I wanted to become. Thank you until like, you make it. That's it, right? But, but it's also, it, cre it, it took pressure off me. And so like, I would run out to snap a game winning field goal in zero degree weather with a 40 mile an hour crosswind and rain hard with a 340 pound guy over me. And I just pretended like we were on a movie set and all these people are union. Everybody wants to go home. It's freezing. Just snap the ball. This guy kick it. Let's just all go home. We're all friends. <laughs> but that's the narrative I told myself. And then sure enough, it relaxed me. And then boom, next thing you know, you become what you visualize yourself to become. Well, you've done an amazing job in your life of visualizing what you wanted to do, what you wanted to be. I know you wanted to be on TV. You were such, I think you were America's, you know, one of the most popular contestants. I mean, the, the amount of views you have on your America's Got Talent videos are, it's insane. Yeah, there's, there's one that's up to like 90 million views. It's crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. Not, like, yeah, 85, 90 million views for this. Uh, somebody put together like a, uh, it's all the, the performances in one. Right. And it's, it's, you know, 88 million or something. It's crazy. Well, congratulations, John, on, on an amazing career. You're still in the beginning of your life. You're still in your, you're, you're only 40, right? Yeah. So you've got a long, many, many decades left and stay well and healthy. And thank you for inspiring all of us and, and showing us, you know, what it means to be a champion, what it means to be somebody who can forgive, somebody who can visualize and embody you know, what they, what they want to be. And I know you have this famous quote that you like from uh, a movie that we both love, A Star is Born. Mm -hmm. And there's something that you, you like to, you know, remind people of, you know, something about what you say is, is what you, how you'll be remembered and what you say is who you'll be. Can you tell That's us it, that? Right. Well, it, it was, a, it was a cool quote in that movie. And it was basically, you know, in music, there's only 12 notes, right? And how you say it, that's what differentiates you. Right. Well, that's life. We're all in this thing together. But how you say it, how you act, and who, who you want to portray yourself as, that's how you're going to be remembered. And all of a sudden, you got a moment. you got one moment when the world's listening. What would you say? And if you, could, if you could pick that moment, what would that moment be? Well, strive for that moment. 
strive for the opportunity for the world to say, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear what you say because it's going to make this world a better place. And when that moment comes, say what you mean. And I, I believe this, may every one of us realize that we can control what we can control. And there's things in this world we can't control. Be okay with it. Be okay with change. Be okay with forgiveness. Be okay with closure. But if the moment comes for us to have an opportunity to change the world and we're not prepared for it and we're not ready for it, shame on me. So may every one of us control what you can control and keep moving forward and realize this, like in me in sports, there's the quarterback, there's the receiver, there's all these famous people, right? They're all up here. They make all the money. Well, the long snapper, we're about right here on the coolness pyramid, right? We're about down here. But guess what? They can't win without me and I can't win without them. So it doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't matter what your job is. It is important. It is necessary. It is needed. So be the best you can at it and help this whole thing go round and round. And may we all celebrate together as champions like that, baby. Amazing. You are a true champion. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for joining me. This has been awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me, man. You're a rock star. And uh, I just want to say thank you all for coming and joining me between the palms. <laughs> Take care, man. You too.